Welcome back to Think Tech here on a Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters, and we have Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski. He's a rabbi of Chabad of Hawaii. It's very important we talk to him once in a while, get perspective, and, uh, you know, have the wisdom that rabbis, only rabbis, can provide. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. So we have some things going on. I, I would like your reaction, if you don't mind, as a, as a rabbi, as a spiritual leader. We have the we have the, the 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 coronavirus. We have the demise of the stock market with fifteen hundred points down today. Um, you know we have the prospect of a, a global not only pandemic but endemic. You know a, a permanent condition of of threatening even a, a deadly virus. Um, and and uh, all of that doesn't seem so good. So what does the Jewish reaction to that? What is your reaction to that? Well, first of all, uh, it's important to take the necessary precautions, obviously, that uh, the experts are advising us on. But in answer to your question, you know, as, you ref as we reflect on this uh, endemic or pandemic, uh, I think there's a lot of thoughts that come to mind. Uh, firstly, uh, how interconnected humanity is civilization is you know we think that um, we're all islands to ourselves and therefore we only have to look out for ourselves but uh, here comes this uh, pandemic and it uh, it's a wake-up call and it uh, reminds us that you know that at least in this area we're so um, vulnerable because we are impacted by uh, those around us and therefore it's important to not just build ourselves but to um, think of of the uh, of everyone of all of humanity these are just thoughts that uh, you know that, that I'm having you know uh, yeah. also you know all of Judaism is about uh, being is about spreading spreading uh, God's values and God's teachings by being a certain way, by living in a certain way. And um, we see from this whole endemic how one region, one person, whoever, wh wh wherever, from wherever it began, is having a ripple effect and it's uh, cascading and touching every corner of the world. And um, it, you know, it, it, can ser it should serve to uh, start us thinking along the lines how each and every one of us, as even though we're only individuals, have the ability on, uh, on the good side to actually have uh, outsized impact on the world around us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that the biggest problem is sometimes, even though we always say that the problem in our society is people are, you know, think too highly of themselves, egotistical and all that kind of stuff. But it's the flip side of that is that very often we underestimate our abilities, we underestimate uh, what we could do, what we can bring, the good that we can bring to the world. And every once in a while when we look at this kind of a phenomena, it should serve to, um, to, to teach us, to remind us that, in fact, we have a very, very, very big ability to influence the world and influence the yeah, yeah. people around us. And care for each other and work together and collaborate on solving problems that affect everyone. And I think sometimes we forget that. And once in a while you have what I consider this kind of a, a biblical reminder that we really must work together or else. I'm reminded of... I hope this resonates with you, with the stories of Chelm, the stories of Chelm. One of the stories of Chelm is about um, these guys had some kind of community crisis and uh, they weren't working together. And each one was looking out for his own interests, his own silo. And, and the lesson of the story was ultimately, if you guys don't work together, you know, you're going to sink the ship. Exactly. So you have to start working together. And, exactly. and, and that goes to nations. It goes to all the divisions. Exactly. On the one hand, these days we see a lot of divisions. but. You know, this is a reminder that we really can't, we can't survive that. Exactly. Way. You know, the Jewish um, dream and aspiration for the millennia has been, you know, the coming of the Messiah. And what is so exciting about the coming of the Messiah is 
that he will bring people together. There won't be no more wars, as the prophet says, as the prophet says, and there won't be this infighting and each one of us pulling in our own direction. There will be this global unity. Yeah, and that's yeah. We that's can pray for that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Rabbi, I, I, on a happier note, uh, we're, we're doing Purim this week, and Purim yes. is a happy festival, one of the happiest, if not the happiest, uh, Jewish holiday in the year, and it's all about Iran, or may I say Persia. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> and, ancient you know, Persia. Ancient Persia, and it was you, you and I had a, com a conversation, a show, about this very topic just a year ago in early March 2019, so let's review what Purim is, how it came about, what it means. Sure. So Purim, as you said, is one of the uh, Jewish holidays, and it is the most festive of the Jewish holidays, even though it's not a biblical holiday, it's not in the Torah. Uh, however, this, uh, the setting of the story took place after the destruction of the first temple, before the Common Era, I'm not sure exactly what year. And the Jews at that time were, after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, the Jews were exiled through the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, to Babylon, modern-day Iraq. And over time, um, the Persians were fighting with the, with the Babylonians, and then the Persians became the uh, world power. So in that setting is the whole story of Purim. And uh, what the story is in a nutshell, and we, all, we have the Megillah, the story of Purim, the scroll of Esther uh, that we read uh, every year to review the story and the great miracle of Purim. So how did the word Megillah get to mean uh, something really long? <laughs> <laughs> the, the literal uh, meaning of the word Megillah is a scroll. And uh, this is the scroll, of <coughs> the scroll of Esther that tells the whole story in detail. So when somebody goes on and on and on, he's <laughs> telling us the whole Megillah. <laughs> okay. So basically, um, there was a king, his name was Ahasuerus, and he had a wife named Vashti. And uh, after three years that he was sitting on the throne, he threw a big, big party. And he invited all of the uh, subjects of his land to celebrate with him at this great, great celebration. And in a moment, I'll share uh, with you why he threw this big party. And at the party, he got drunk, and he insisted that his wife, Vashti, uh, come before all the attend attendees and to show off her beauty. And she obviously refused. And uh, Ahasuerus, uh, in a stupor of drunkenness, said, off with her head, because she didn't uh, listen to his command. So after they killed her, and he woke up in the morning, and he sobered up, and he realized now that he's wifeless. So... Um, Talk about creating your own problems. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he consulted with his advisors, and they said, no, the king needs a wife, needs a queen. So they had this big, big pageant, and all of the girls were invited to uh, come and join this pageant, and whomever the king will, will love more than anyone else will be the next queen, he'll be his wife. And there was a Jewish woman, a Jewish girl, her name was Esther. <clears throat> she had an uncle whose name was Mordechai. Mordechai was the leader of the Jewish people at the time. And Mordechai said to Esther that she should go <clears throat> And she should also petition, uh, she should be in this pageant. And she went reluctantly, and lo and behold, from all of the uh, beautiful uh, Persian uh, girls, Esther was the one that Ahasuerus fell in love with, and she became the next queen. Uh, Mordechai instructed her not to tell the king uh, about her background, that she's Jewish, and just to keep it a secret. Uh, so she became the queen, and Mordechai started hanging out ne you know, in the, uh, next to the king's palace. One day when Mordechai was hanging out in the king's palace, because Mordechai was the leader of the Jewish people and he was the head of the Sanhedrin, the, 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 the body of uh, the, the legislative body, the Jewish legislative body, 
And one of the requirements to be the head of the Sanhedrin was to be able to speak all of the languages, the 70 languages of the world. So he understood all the languages and the dialects of the different languages. And being in the king's, hanging out next to the king's uh, palace, he heard two employees of the king talking between each other in their local language, how they were planning, attempting to poison the king. Uh, by feeding him, you know, food that he that would poison him. So uh, Mordechai immediately sent word to Esther, and Esther passed that information on to Ahasuerus's people. And the next morning, when they brought the food, these two people, big son of Seresh, brought the food to the king. They had the dog taste it, and the dog instantly died. So they realized they saw it's correct, and uh, the king's life was spared. In the meantime, there was a minister. His name was Haman, Haman, who was from the uh, the nation of Amal Amalek, the Amalekites, the biblical Amalekites, who were evil people. And Amalek was an anti-Semite. The Megillah tells us because when um, uh, Haman uh, rose to power, the rule of the land was that when he passed by, you had to bow down to him. And because Mordechai would not bow down to him, because as a Jew, we don't bow down to, to any human being other than God, so this infuriated Haman, and he decided not, not to take his revenge against Mordechai, but against all of the Jewish people. So um, he was planning the scheme to, um, to, have Mordechai, to, 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 to have Mordechai hung, and a decree issued. He was planning to go to Achashverosh to issue a decree to annihilate all the Jewish people uh, somewhat like what Hitler uh, tried to do. And uh, when Mordechai heard of this decree, he immediately uh, began, you know, uh, call, uh, calling the Jewish people together to gather together to pray and fast and petition God to, to, to save the Jewish people. And at the same time, uh, he sent word to Esther that she should go plead before the king and reveal her identity to the king and tell the, ask the king to spare the Jewish people from this decree. And then in the meantime, the Megillah tells us that one evening, Ahasuerus couldn't sleep, so he asked his, uh, his, uh, his attendants who were attending him to read from the king's chronicles. So they opened it up and opened up the book and they read the story how Mordechai saved the king's life uh, years ago. So the king asked, and what did we do to Mordechai for saving my life? What, what reward did we give him? So they looked in the book and they saw there was no reward given to Mordechai. <coughs> At that very moment, there was a knock on the door in the middle of the night. And who was it? It was Haman at the door coming to Ahasuerus to uh, discuss with him his scheme of having Mordechai hung. And this is right after that they read to Mordechai, they read to Ahasuerus the story how Mordechai saved the king's life. So before Haman was even able to begin talking, Ahasuerus asked Haman, tell me, uh, my, my trusted advisor, what, sh what is appropriate to do to someone who saved the king's life and the king owes him a debt of gratitude? So Haman, the egotistical person that he was, figured that the Ahasuerus was talking about him, about Haman, and how he, being this, you know, this important minister, is saving the kingdom. So he said to Ahasuerus that the person who the king wants to show honor and gratitude uh, should be paraded down the main boulevard of Shushan, which was the capital of uh, Persia, and they should have a person, uh, and that person should ride the king's horse and wear the king's clothes, and have a person, uh, people running before the horse and saying, this is how uh, the person that the king shows gratitude, this is how he is uh, rewarded. And Ahasuerus says, good idea, now go and do exact that, exact, exactly that to Mordechai the Jew. <laughs> <laughs> and Haman almost had a heart attack, <laughs> but he had no choice. In the meantime, <clears throat> um, Esther, <clears throat> Esther uh, came to Ahasuerus and said, 
can you do me a, a big favor? And I would like to invite you and Haman to a private party. And the king right away sent word to Haman to come to the palace for a private party with Esther. And, the, and Esther threw this party, and the king said to Esther, so tell me, my wife, what is it that you would like, and why are you throwing this party? So she said that I, am, I, I need to ask a favor, I need to plead with you to save my people from annihilation. And the king said, what, what people are you talking about? Because he didn't know that she was Jewish. So she said that my people are the Jewish people, and they're uh, being threatened with annihilation because of Haman, and she pointed to Haman, because of Haman uh, who, uh, who issued this, this decree with your blessings. So they immediately the, the uh, decree was nullified, and the day that was set to be the day for uh, all this annihilation, turned, turned, uh, things turned around, and it became a day of great celebration, a great joy, and this is the holiday of Purim that we celebrate. And uh, the tradition is that, you know, people get dressed up on Purim. I'm sure, Jay, as you remember as a kid, people get dressed up on Purim because Purim, uh, the story of Purim basically um, expresses the idea how things can turn around and things are concealed and things are not revealed. So the commentaries point out that the miracle of Purim is a very fascinating miracle and very different than the miracle, the biblical miracles that we find in the Bible are, for example, the splitting of the Red Sea, where God temporarily suspends the laws of nature and the supernatural occurs. In the story of Purim, there's nothing supernatural here, but all of these coincidences uh, came together in such a fantastic way that as we look back and we look at the whole picture, we recognize that this was no coincidence, but this was in fact God's doing. So the fact that before Haman's rise to power, God arranged that Ahasuerus should have his wife killed so they should be seeking a new wife, a new queen, and Esther should be in place. So when Haman would indeed uh, rise to power, she would be able to uh, plead for her people. The fact that Haman's coming to Ahasuerus to discuss hanging Mordechai was at the very moment that they happened to read to Ahasuerus how Mordechai saved his life. These are not these are not coincidences. These are God's pulling the strings, so to speak. And um, the commentaries further point out that there's something very interesting, and that is that in the book of the Megillah, in the scroll of Esther, which is one of the, is part of the Old Testament. The Old Testament consists of 24 books, and the, and the Megillah of Esther, the scroll of Esther, is one of those 24 books. There's something unique about the Megillah, and that is that God's name is not mentioned even one time. And that's an oddity that we don't find anywhere else in the Bible where God's name is front, center, and le everywhere you turn, God is talking and God is saying. And so God why? Is, is there a reason? Anybody so yes, figure it out? Yes. No. So the reason they say is because this represents the concealment, so to speak, that God is, it was not apparent. God was, uh, was concealed. God's hand, God's hand was concealed. And one can mistakenly think that if you don't see God, that means he's absent. He's not there. So the story of the Megillah is that even, even while, when God seems to be absent, He's very, very present. Mm -hmm. He's in the story. He's in the story. It's, it's his a miraculous footprints, set of circumstances. His footprints, his, foot, his hand, his yeah. prints are all over the place. Yeah. And, and that's an important lesson for each and every one of us in our own lives. Sometimes we, we think that God is absent from our life. He's busy doing something else and He's not paying attention. And not answering our needs, but uh, as we look, if we step back, we'll realize that he's guiding every step of our way of our lives. Well, it's a charming story too, and uh, you talk about uh, putting putting um, uh, uh, costumes on yeah. and all that. And I remember people had costumes for all the players you've mentioned for Mordecai, for mm -hmm. Ahasuerus, right. for uh, all the girls Esther. were Esther and. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even Haman. <laughs> Haman. Haman also, the people, people dressed up for, for Haman as well.
Yes. And I, you know, I always thought that was really interesting. It's sort of like a Halloween, you know, and it says everybody wears a costume and they all have fun. And then they have these uh, noisemakers right. in the temple. They the, have the noisemakers. The, right, the groggers. To, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and when anybody reads the, the, the word Haman, the name Haman from the Megillah, they, they make yes. raz, raz noises about it. Now, something very interesting. Um, the story that I just shared with you, in the, the story that's shared in the Megillah, is read in a total of, of 11 chapters. It takes about 20 minutes to read it. But in real life, it took about 15 years from when Ahasuerus threw the party until the whole the decree and the turn of the events. Mm. So those people who are living through it may not have connected the dots and not have realized that what happened nine years ago was the catalyst for the turning of events today. So the, the, the whole uh, message of the Megillah is that all the dots are connected. We may not see, we may not see it that way. Um, and, um, and this is one of the powerful messages of, uh, of the Megillah. Now, what's interesting is that uh, the story of the Megillah doesn't begin with the story of the Megillah. It actually begins generations earlier the, 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 the uh, Torah tells us, the Talmud tells us that the first Jewish king, his name was Shoal. Shoal was from the tribe of Benjamin. As we know that our forefather Jacob had 12 children that comprised the 12 tribes of the Jewish people. And the first king, his name was Shaul, Saul, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, in the Bible, the tells, we, we, we learn that there was a nation called Amalek, the Amalekites, who ambushed the Jewish people when they left Egypt for no reason. They, were, they, they provoked it. There was, no, there was nothing, there was no reason for them to, uh, to ambush the Jewish people. And so then God said to Moses that we shall erase the name of Amalek. In other words, Amalek represents a kind of evil that cannot be elevated or transformed. It has to be uh, destroyed. And when Saul was the, was the king, when he became king, the prophet Samuel came to him and said, now is the time to, to take up arms and to uh, kill the Amalekites. And Saul did that, and he killed the nation of Amalek, except for the leader, who he reasoned was an elderly person, and there was no harm in keeping him alive. It was the younger people that, that, he, that, that he waged battle against. So the story is, is told in the, in, in the Bible that s the prophet Samuel came to uh, Saul and said, did you follow through on God's command? And he said, yes, I did. She so said, how was it that you didn't kill the king, Agog? He says, well, because um, I didn't think he, was, he, was, uh, he would be a harm. So the prophet Samuel said that because Saul didn't listen and follow through to the letter of God's command, he would lose his kingship, and then King David was the one who arose in his place and became the Jewish king. So the Talmud tells us that Agog, that evening, was with his wife, and she conceived, and the descendant of that child was Haman. Ah, uh, that's the context right there. And in the story of Purim, uh, it was uh, it was Mordechai that saved the day for the Jewish people. And what's interesting is Mordechai was from the tribe of Benjamin, like the first king Saul. So with the mistake that his, his ancestor made, generations later, Mordechai fixed by uh, being the one who uh, brought the downfall of Haman. And there's a very fascinating story, uh, a prologue to this whole story, that in the Nuremberg trials, after uh, World War II, there was, the Megillah tells us that there were, um, Haman had uh, 10 children and they were all hung. In the Nuremberg trials, there were 11 Nazis, high ranking uh, Nazis, that um, were, they were put on trial and they were all judged to be hung. One of them, uh, one of the big ones, I forget his name now, committed suicide the night before he swallowed some cyanide. 
So the next day, ten were hung. One of them, while he was being hung, cried out, Purim Fest. Purim. Yeah. What was that about? Because, because the Nazism were the descendants of Haman. They were pure evil. And just like in the story of Purim, where the ten were hung, the ten, Haman's ten children were hung, these ten generals, Nazi generals, were hung. So it, it's, it, you know, it, it, it runs through, it pulsates through history. It's not just connecting the dots, you know, in our lifetime, but connecting the dots from the beginning of time to the end of yeah, time. Yeah, well, it sounds like a, a real story in the sense that w these, hap these things happened and they were passed down the generations um, and they it kept on going down the generations. And, and if you look today at Iran, uh, you find a, a lot of anti-Semitism. They exactly. wanted to destroy Israel exactly. and all that. It, it, it is the one singular country that, that um, is so publicly and vehemently anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. So, I mean, Akashverus didn't do a, a good job in, in terms of uh, passing the word along that, you know, leave, leave the Jews alone, they're okay. Yeah. And, the, and the country uh, you know, still managed to be anti-Semitic from then till now, a couple thousand years anyway. So the most important point is to say that Purim is a very joyous day. It's a very happy time. Everyone's invited to come to actually our new Chabad house. We have a new address. It's 2241 Kapilani Boulevard. It's Kapilani Makali. And everyone who hears this uh, is invited to come join us tomorrow evening. We're going to have, we're going read to read the Megillah and have a big Purim party, come come dressed up and have fun. <laughs> and Pick your character. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we could use a little cheer in these frightening times. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rabbi, it's, uh, it's great to go through the Megillah with you. <laughs> I, I sure appreciate it. And you know, uh, this, the, the detail you've given us, the Megillah level detail you've given us is very valuable to know about, to think about. And so as you say, all the dots are connected and uh, all of this has relevance in our time. Exactly. And uh, gee, I, I wish uh, I wish the world could know what you're saying. I I hope everybody watches this, and I hope everybody shows up tomorrow, the tenth, the tenth yes. of March. Right at 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 five thirty, mm -hmm. we're going to have the Megillah reading and the party. Great. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank down. you for inviting me again. Happy Purim. Happy Purim.